uh, nucleic acid substrate doesn't look that much different from a far off view from a, a globular protein enzyme with an active site cleft holding on to its substrate. This particular picture always reminds me of Godzilla climbing the Empire State Building. Uh, the Godzilla is the RNA catalyst, and this other piece of RNA shown as the colored helix is the, is the Empire State Building part, is the substrate that it is acting upon. So how did we uh, then come to this notion that RNA could be a catalyst? Well, we weren't searching for it. And for many years, I, I uh, declined to tell this story because I was more interested in telling recent results from our laboratory's research than uh, ancient, what seemed like ancient history. But I realized that it was important for students to get a sense of how new things are discovered in molecular biology or, for that matter, in any science. I think that when you read a textbook, you often get the idea that the scientist is standing over here looking at a discovery to be made out there somewhere and designs a series of experiments to march from the idea to make the discovery, at which point it's written down in the textbooks. And I used to say that only in some areas of, th of physics uh, are things ever so clear and clear-cut when some physicist friends assured me that nothing of any interest in physics had ever been discovered in such an easy way either. Much more common is for discoveries to involve a big dose of serendipity. Now, serendipity, I think, was best defined by Louis Pasteur, who said that chance favors only the prepared mind. He, of course, said it in French, not in English. But the idea is that there is luck involved, there is chance involved, but that if you don't have the right training, the right education and experience and laboratory skills, but also an open mind and the right um, mental disposition to be open to the, chance, the chances that or the luck that falls in your way, then you won't make these discoveries. So it's this interplay between chance and between your, your training and scientific intuition, which is always very much the part of scientific discovery, as you'll see. Uh, our work started out with this ciliated protozoan. Protozoan means it's a single-celled animal. The cilia are these hair-like projections which move the uh, organism through the pond water. So this is found in freshwater ponds throughout the world. And we chose to study this organism because it shared with human cells the division of uh, the cell into a nucleus where the DNA is kept and the cytoplasm where protein synthesis takes place. So it's a eukaryotic cell and therefore a good model for eukaryotic molecular biology in general. But these cells are as easy to grow as bacteria. You can grow a flask full of millions of cells quite cheaply and easily. And the choice of this particular organism was determined by the fact that within this large so-called macronucleus, there were 10,000 identical copies of a particular gene all doing the same thing, producing ribosomal RNA to become part of the ribosome at the same time. And that was an unusual feature to have so many copies of the same gene that we thought it would be an excellent system for studying the process called transcription. Transcription uh, involves the copying of the information present in the double helix of DNA into an RNA copy. This occurs when RNA polymerase, which is a protein enzyme, sits down at a particular sequence of nucleotides along the DNA that it recognizes and is, uh, moves in the direction shown by the arrowhead, makes an RNA copy of this part of the double helix, opening the double helix transiently as it goes, and then there's a stop sign over here, which is the place where there's a, a, another signal built into the system, which causes the polymerase to, to uh, jump off of the DNA at that point. Now, in the process of trying to study the copying of DNA into RNA, we found 
as uh, Joe Gall and, and his co-workers at uh, Yale University had also found it a, at, uh, a, year late, a year earlier in a related system, that this DNA was interrupted by a stretch of uh, what's shown here as green DNA. This is a, a non-coding sequence called an intervening sequence or an intron. And these had been uh, the general phenomenon that genes in eukaryotic organisms often have their coding sequences interrupted by stretches of non-coding DNA had been uh, found a couple of years earlier by Phil Sharp and his co-workers at uh, MIT and also a group uh, led by Rich Roberts at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in New York. And so this wasn't a new finding, and it was already known by, uh, by then that the RNA polymerase, which copies DNA into RNA, doesn't do anything different when it encounters one of these stretches of non-coding DNA, that it copies it right along with the flanking coding regions to give the uh, precursor, to give a precursor RNA, which then is subsequently spliced uh, Points X and Y have to be broken and rejoined to give the mature or functional form of the RNA molecule. So if you want to study this first step of gene expression, you, maybe you don't need to worry about these interruptions in the DNA. However, when we set out to set up a uh, test tube system for watching the copying of DNA into RNA, we found that not only was that process occurring, but that this subsequent RNA splicing step was also occurring outside of the cell in the test tube. And this uh, was a very intriguing finding because at this point, which was about 1979, there was only one other laboratory, that of John Abelson in Southern California, that had ever seen RNA splicing take place outside of a cell in a test tube. And there were a hundred laboratories or more throughout the world studying transcription, but a lot of interest and not much knowledge about this subsequent step in the expression of a gene. So we decided to allow ourselves to get sidetracked from our original goal of studying DNA makes RNA and to instead engage in some studies of trying to understand RNA splicing. In particular, we wanted to find the enzymatic machinery that would cut and paste the RNA in this very specific way. Out of some 7,000 nucleotides, only two sites were chosen as sites of this rearrangement, always at the, exactly the same place. And clearly a process that took place with this much specificity and with this much rate acceleration over the normal rate of cutting, the spontaneous rate of cutting of an RNA chain, uh, which would be very slow, must be catalyzed. And it was known that all catalysts were protein enzymes. And so, of course, we were going to find the protein enzyme that was responsible for, or, or maybe enzymes, there might be several of them, that were responsible for this process. Now, when a biochemist uh, wants to purify the catalytic apparatus responsible for a particular transformation, you start out with the molecule prior to it having uh, undergone the reaction, in this case, unspliced RNA that still contains the intron as well as the flanking sequences, which are sometimes called exons. They're on the outside. They're the mature sequences which the cell is going to end up retaining. So we took this unspliced RNA and mixed it together with a nuclear extract from the tetrahymena cells because we knew that our sp splicing was taking place in the nucleus. The idea was to mix these together in a test tube in the presence of small molecules which are found in all cells. The critical ingredients in this molecular recipe turned out to be uh, magnesium ion and guanosine triphosphate, itself one of the building blocks of RNA. So this is the G that's found in uh, ribonucleic acid.